Suppression Quest is a game slash interactive fiction slash choose your own adventure slash new media experience slash, uh, seriously, the lines between mediums has gotten so blurred that it's totally awesome, but understandably confusing. It's from 2013. It was made by Zoe Quinn, Patrick Lindsay, and Isaac Shankler. In the game, the player assumes the role of a person, functionally themselves, afflicted with depression, and is tasked with navigating a variety of day-to-day -day activities with the burden of illness. It is an absolutely brilliant example of the merger of mechanics and narrative. First, we need to lay the groundwork, so let's talk about limitations. Every video game is a box. It's contained. It's bounded. It's defined by its limitations. You can only go to the places in the game that have been built, use the tools that have been programmed in, or select the options that have been given to you. These limitations and rules form the game itself. The focus and push form the narrative. You can't negotiate with the demons in Doom because it's literally not an option. In Skyrim, you can't probe Jarl Balgriff for the kinky details of his sex life because those details don't exist in-game. Not only is the option never present, the contingencies for its presence simply don't exist. The data just isn't in the files, and that fact that something must be built in order to exist is a wall that all games run into. This wall is so common that it forms the underpinning of the basic language for how we interact with games. Remember, every video game is a box. When we load up a game, we go into the box where we are presented with options. We choose which option we want, and then the game tells us what happens as a result. For the vast majority of narrative-driven games, this relationship is incredibly simple, often bordering on being reductive. The game presents singular goals that the player then executes. Get to point A, progress to point B, choose path C1 or C2. This is not a judgment of that arrangement, it's simply the stuff that games are made of, and much the same can be said about books or movies. Get to end of page, turn page, read next page. It's not a bad thing by any means, nor is it a good thing. It's just a thing. It's the mechanical language that these games are written in, and anyone who's played several instinctively comes to understand it. Here's a waypoint, that's where you're expected to go. Here's an NPC with an exclamation mark, that's where you trigger your next set of goals. We have become so trained and conditioned to speak in this language and accept this power dynamic that we now have a pile of games like Bioshock, Spec Ops The Line, and The Stanley Parable that call attention to it by either subverting it within the narrative or providing players with the opportunity to subvert it themselves. Enter the door on his left. This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. All of this, the box, the wall, the language, and what the player does with and between it all, this is the implicit substance of player agency. Depression Quest strips all that substance back to its most basic form, that of the text adventure. Now, I want to do a callback here to something that I mentioned way back in the first season of the show. In music videos 1996 to 2000, Isolation, we talked a bit about how logistics can inform the themes of the final product, the example being the video for Lisa Loeb's song Do You Sleep. Making things is difficult and complicated and only gets more complicated the more people that are involved because the more people that are involved the more coordination you need just to keep things from grinding to a halt. There is a reason a lot of web shows are made by one person. In the example video, Lisa Loeb is the only person to appear on camera and the entire thing takes place on two sets that are almost certainly about 10 feet apart from each other in the same studio space. The isolated themes of the song were supported by the logistical slash financial decisions to use a bare minimum of resources. Depression Quest falls into the same realm. The form of the game, a text adventure, is a direct product of logistical limitations. Quinn was working more or less alone on the project for the vast majority of the time and, in her own valuation, didn't really know much about programming at all, and chose to build the game in Twine, a free program for creating interactive narratives that uses markup rather than scripting or programming. But it works so well for the end product. In a text adventure, the implicit substance of player agency is laid bare. In more complex games, the web of available, meaningful decisions is obfuscated by other systems and methods of agency expression. Even the simple ability to wander around aimlessly in an empty room does a lot to expand the player's sense of how free they are, even if they're ultimately just making their way from point A to B. It's a mechanism of the suspension of disbelief. In a text adventure, that's not present. 
the player is literally presented with a list of all the available choices to pick from. And this is where Depression Quest does something absolutely brilliant. Many, many, many times throughout the game, options are presented as non-options, appearing on the list but unavailable for selection. This is a beautiful merger of the game's mechanics, the language of gameplay, and the underlying themes of the game. It is an explicit acknowledgement that the box could be bigger, but isn't, which is in turn used as a demonstration that logical decisions aren't always available to a depressed mind. Often, this narrative device is used to communicate the subtle nuance of the disease by demonstrating the slight cognitive differences between otherwise identical actions, such as this early choice where you decide how to spend your evening. Outwardly, choices 1 and 2 are the same, both resulting in going out with your girlfriend, but shaking off the funk is simply impossible. In the same way that a depressed person can't just snap out of it, the player cannot choose the first option. It exists in a void between knowing and capability. The game is informing the player that it is aware of the idea of the option, but not providing it. Depression, and indeed many mental illnesses, create a similar gap between what is known and what is perceived. In essence, Depression Quest uses the nature of its own mechanics, indeed the fundamental language of video game narratives, to communicate not just the forms that depression takes, but the very essence of it, the sense of robbery that the afflicted has had something of their personal agency stolen from them. Normally, narrative games go out of their way to disguise those limitations, hide them as best as possible, or distract the player from thinking about them. Depression Quest puts those limitations front and center, openly stripping the player of their agency in order to make it personal. So the question then is, if all of that is the box that Depression Quest is built from, what comes out the other side? The narrative follows the course of about eight months in the life of the protagonist, who is you or a depressed version of you. The choices that you make at each stage influence the state of the narrative as it progresses, changing the mood, opening up, or further limiting the options for how you approach problems. Rather than trying to encompass grand changes in a vast network of possible futures, the narrative stays rooted in the plausible, the familiar, exploring not just the basic limitations of living with depression, but the deep ruts, the near paralysis, and the unending monotony. The scenarios are ordinary and common, socializing with strangers, coping with an unengaging job, managing relationships with family, friends, and a lover, and then doing it all over again. It ends not with a grand conclusion, but a step back, a reflection of how your health has improved or decayed over the months based on the small, incremental changes that you made, decision by decision, day by day. This is a case where the mechanics and the narrative are so intimately entwined that they can't help but drive each other. From choice to choice it is clear that there are mechanical underpinnings, game states being tracked and all that, but they're communicated in intentionally vague and generalized ways. If your state decays, you watch as options close off, the decisions you make building the prison that dictates if you're even capable of coping with changes. Blocks of text at the bottom inform you of your current status, and a haze of static grows more or less intense as your condition improves or worsens. The exact results of each choice are obfuscated, and you're left to your own judgment. If you're doing well, you can always backslide, and no matter how bad things get, you can always turn it around. The result is something that's not merely impacting, but authentic. I realize that that is a very personal judgment, but in this case it's almost impossible to avoid. Depression Quest is, to its core, a personal game that asks you to expose something of your own fragility, your own frustrations and fears, your own sense of powerlessness. Even if you're on the road to recovery, the game still pervades a sense of fragility and anxiety that you're not actually improving, you're just on an upswing and at any moment it could all come crashing down. And yet, for all its low, grinding, oppressive atmosphere, Depression Quest is fundamentally hopeful, believing that recovery and stability are not only possible, but attainable. Even if you've never experienced depression, it is a glimpse through a window at how the disease grinds you down, isolates you, and robs you of your power to act. It is a game about empathy. The beautiful thing about it is that this is the kind of thing that can only be done in an interactive medium. That sense of robbery, of violation and limitation, and the elation of recovery, of reclaiming that humanity, cannot exist outside the implicit substance of player agency. That's important because this type of depth, this empathy game, couldn't exist in a different medium.